trigger warning, acne scars. And then he told me something which really broke me. Um, he told me that I would have to run around with those scars that I had and they were like really heavy and like my whole face was purple because the scars mm. hadn't faded yet. Um, that I would run around with that for the rest of my life, even if I've re received laser treatment and stuff. And for me, it was just like I was marked for the rest of my mm. life and always having to see this, not only these scars, but like the bad time, this bad time of my life. And I just, I completely lost it in the sense of I started crying when we went out and my mother asked me like is this all like this whole skin thing and I was like nah mm. it's not and I I finally told her and um, she asked me if I wanted to see a therapist so I did hello you beautiful people out there I'm so happy to have you here before we start the episode I want to make a short trigger warning because we are talking about depression and suicidality in this episode. And for some of you out there, the content may be disturbing. So please be aware of it. Our main goal here is to make you feel less alone with your experience and to give you a new perspective and guide you in the right direction to the right resources. If you are looking for those, feel free to check out the description of this episode because we put some good stuff for you in there. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode. So you precious beans out there, welcome to the first episode of the Relatable Podcast. My name is Maxim, for those who don't know me yet. And that's the podcast where you can be a voice for those who feel the same way as you do. We are talking here in a real and relatable way and our goal is just to make you feel less alone and understood in your experience. I'm doing this the first time, so my English could be a little bit blah, blah, but I'm trying my best. And I have today on the other side of the table, Laura. Um, if you want, you can say a little bit uh, about yourself. And, um, yeah. Yeah, sure. Hi, um, <laughs> my name is Laura. I'm here for the very first time. I just met Maxime through um, a colleague and heard about his podcast and I just really liked the idea. So I came here to tell my story. Yeah, that's very cool. And and also I want to, um, I appreciate the, the courage because I, I know for myself and for many other people, it's uh, not easy to talk about heavy stuff like that. And you're doing a great service for others. Thank you. <laughs> I yeah. guess. And uh, yeah, as as you um, could maybe see in the title, we are talking today in this episode um, about depression and therapy, about Laura's story, how she felt during that episode of her life, and also how she came out of that all. And um, I don't know where where would you like to start? Where Where does your journey journey start? Well, I guess just at the beginning. <laughs> um, okay, so um, it pretty much all started in 2016. It was the year before I um, had my finals in school. Um, it was just, there were a lot of small things that pretty much happened. They never really like badly affected me in a way that you would be like, okay, she was sexually abused, so that's what, why she got depressed or she was beaten or experienced bullying. Nothing like that ever happened to me. For me, um, well, very first of all, depression runs in my family. So I have a huge genetic component mm. for depression. And the first time I really got to know about that was when I was 14, maybe. So my cousin got depressed and um, yeah, it was, it wasn't really a great time. It runs, like I said, in my family. And I was always very scared of, um, being depressed of getting depression and i think that fear actually also mm -hmm, led mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. to the depression actually um so that was one component my my huge genetic component i was pretty much prone to it and um in that time in 2016 like i said i was preparing for my finals so i was very stressed um school wise and um we moved not really far but i still felt like i was ripped out from my social environment mm -hmm. the one i knew And then 
the um, boyfriend of my best friend got diagnosed with um, a tumor in his brain. And he was also my friend and it was just a very heavy time. It was, it wasn't really fun. It was a lot of hospital visits and um, going to him. And especially for me, I felt like I lost my best friend because obviously she would rather tend to her boyfriend mm. than to me, which is obvious. And I, I never was angry with her or whatever. Um, I actually regret not being there for her more mm. because at some point I felt so ignored and alone and with the moving, it was just, I felt isolated, like more or less completely. Now, not only in private, but also in school, because everyone was tending to the sick boyfriend and just my, my friend group got ripped apart, basically. Um, also, I I used to have very heavy acne. Obviously, you can't see me, but right now I... <laughs> it's I, shit. Yeah, it really, really sucks. And... Now, pretty much none of it is left. I barely have scars, but... Um, you have really good skin. <laughs> thank you. It's a shit ton of work. Yeah. Um, absolutely. <laughs> and so um, that's where my, more or less, my breakdown began. Because um, I started to, to see um, a dermatologist. I was never very comfortable in my skin. Mm -hmm. Not just like my literal skin, but also like my body in general. Yeah. I never felt comfortable in it. I guess that's what most of young teenagers go through. Definitely. Yeah. So we went to the dermatologist, me and my mother. It was the first time and I was already so pissed at her because she didn't take me there earlier, mm. which obviously isn't her fault. I mean, I was 17. I could have gone there by, uh, by myself, um, but I just didn't have the courage, I guess. I just wanted it to be forgotten. Like if I don't talk about it, no one else does and no one sees it. It's bullshit, obviously. So we went there and he told me that I should receive treatment for at least like a year, which already scared me. And then he told me something which really broke me. Um, he told me that I would have to run around with those scars that I had and they were like really heavy and like my whole face was purple because the scars mm. hadn't faded yet. Um, that I would run around with that for the rest of my life, even if I received laser treatment and stuff. And for me, it was just like, I was marked for the rest of my mm. life and always having to see this, not only these scars, but like the bad time, this bad time of my life. And I just, I completely lost it in the sense of I started crying when we went out and my mother asked me like, is this all like this whole skin thing? And I was like, no, nah, mm. it's not. And I, I finally told her and um, she asked me if I wanted to see a therapist. So I did. Um, yeah, she she did everything pretty much. I didn't. I wasn't really included in this whole therapist thing, which I was really, really happy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, of because I just I was so scared of it. If it was just, if it would have been me who would have to do all of this, I wouldn't have done it. Which is stupid because it literally saved my life. Um, but yeah, so she dragged me to a therapist, a really good one. Um, really thankful for this man. And I saw him the very first time my mother came with me and um, the first 15 minutes were just like talking about insurance stuff. So it was um, pretty calm, even though like inside of me was like this huge internal turmoil because mm -hmm. I was, I didn't know what was going on. Um, Your mom were with you there? Yes, she mm -hmm. was like for the first 15 minutes. And then uh, my therapist sent her oh, in the okay. waiting room okay. to actually talk about the, the real yeah, stuff, yeah. you know. Um, so we started talking and it was, um, for those of you who never received therapy and are thinking about it and are scared of it, it's actually not a bad experience at all. Um, I recently helped a friend to go to therapy and I, um, this, the person was very scared of it as well. Like, do you just sit there and talk <laughs> about your feelings and cry mm. all the time? It's not like that at all. You just go into a room, you sit there and you talk to a person. You basically pay to listen that he listens to you, which is great because I never like, confided in anyone, never, because for me it showed weakness mm -hmm. and I hated that. So um, I always wanted to be the strong one. I always was more or less the crouch for all my friends. They could just lean on me and I'd take mm. all their shit in and be like, I'd give, I'd give great advice and stuff. But for me, I, I also took those stories, those secrets, those problems, I took them with me and mm -hmm. I, I was kind of buried underneath those. Um, and there just wasn't enough space for my own problems to deal with. 
because I had to deal with the problems of my friends all the time. So I finally had a person I could talk to and I wouldn't have to feel bad for talking to this person and throwing my problems at him because he was he was trained, he was yeah. he, he was, he was paid. Yeah. yeah. He he had to listen to me, which was great. <laughs> he didn't have a choice. Um so there I was sitting in the stool and talking to him for the very first time. He was very friendly, he was um he had a great sense of humor, which made things very mm. easy for me. Mm-hmm. And um Yeah, so therapy started and I would go there, um, I think in the beginning it was three times a week and then we um, lessened it to two times a week, Mm -hmm. which um, was good because I had to go to to school and like I said, I had my finals, so everything was super, super stressful in school Um, and at home as well, like I'm I'm a complete overachiever, Mm. so I always (laughs) want to get like the best out of everything Um, and I'm super disappointed if I don't get my A's or my B's. Um, today it's not like that anymore, but then it was. So everything was just way, way, way too much. And therapy was a kind of stress reliever because I could relieve, uh, release my problems into the world, into a safe space. Um, yeah. We chose um, a, a program, a treatment, which... Um, suited me very well it was very logic based um i'm trying to express this in english now because it's uh, it's kind of hard he he gave me a list of um ways of thinking um which are they don't make sense if you read them and those are like mistakes you make Mm. when you think Mm -hmm. um which are very typical for a person with depression so if you're depressed and you read this list and you could just you could like tick boxes, be like, yeah. yep, I'm that. Yep, doing that. Yep, mm-hmm. absolutely. And that was, it, it suited me really well because he um, he asked me to do like a journal and mm-hmm. just note down my my thoughts, if anything would happen, if anything huge was going on, not just like externally, but also internally. If I would have any thought processes I couldn't really deal with or would just go like into a catastrophic um, dystopian universe, whatever. I yeah. tended to do that a lot. So catastrophizing was one of those like thinking errors, I guess mm-hmm. um, you could call them. Like catastrophizing, just um, everything is black and white, everything is your fault, um, just stuff like that. And it's very typical for a person who experienced depression. If you're talking about those things to a person who experienced that, they're like, yeah, completely, I did that, like in retrospect. When you're actually in this depressive phase, you don't see that. Mm -hmm. That's a tricky part with depression because you don't see that this is just a sickness. And if you can't see that it's just a sickness, where do you blame it on yourself? You think that, okay, for whatever reason, suddenly I completely changed my personality. I went from a pretty friendly, bubbly person to someone who wouldn't talk to anyone not even my best friend, my parents, close himself in a room, um, just complete social distancing. So if you're depressed and you're during Corona, you're doing great. But like yeah, at, that, at that time, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. at that time, it really sucked. And I just, um, I was completely isolating myself. And I thought that it was just me. Mm. Like I, my personality changed for whatever. They were just my new character perks or flaws or whatever which obviously is bullshit. The only thing that really changed was the serotonin level in my brain. Um, That's the only thing that changed. And I tried to convince my therapist that it wasn't like that. I was Mm. like, no, this is me now. I'm broken. You have to repair me or I'm unrepairable. I am broken, which, you know, if you're writing that on Tumblr, you're getting great great reviews for that but if you're actually a person a human being who thinks that about themselves and tries to convince other people yeah um that this is the case people will just look at you like questioning be like no you're not Mm -hmm. which is obvious because you're not you're sick your brain has like a flu i always say um but i was convinced it was me um and it was really hard to to get other people to see that obviously because it wasn't true um, so that was really, um, it was really stressful for me. And um, I also like 
in the process of therapy, we went through those um, thinking mistakes, I'm just mm -hmm. going to call them. Um, we went through my journal and identified those mistakes and it was a very good treatment because I'm a very logic-based person and I could just see like, okay, I can identify this mistake in this thought process. So it isn't true. My mm -hmm. therapist was like, yeah, it's not true. What are you thinking? I was like, okay. So I started to realize that those things weren't really me. Um, but it was a very slow and hurtful process. Because depression has this thing where it, act like, it acts like your personality. And when you're going to therapy and it feels like you're trying to change your personality, which mm. by itself goes against the human instinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also received um, medical treatment. So I was on... Um, several kinds of antidepressants and this also is a huge thing where people are like oh no I don't want to go on antidepressants mm. I want to do it just by therapy or talking or whatever um, for me it wasn't because I didn't want to take any chemicals um, I thought and this also was a very big mistake in thinking that just because I'm taking um, medication I'm not going to heal I'm still mm -hmm. going to be sick so what the problem will still be there even though I take medication. So why should I take medication? Um, and my therapist had a very nice um, analogy he told me and that really helped me. He asked me if um, then a diabetic person shouldn't take insulin. Mm. Mm -hmm. I was like, of course not. <laughs> they need that to get their body running. Otherwise they would die. And so he told me, well, antidepressants, which is basically serotonin, is more or less your insulin. You need it or else your body will die eventually from whatever, for example, suicide, which I don't really know the statistics, but I think 10% of all people who are depressed, every fourth person in a crowd is depressed. And I think like around 10% or something actually commits suicide. Um, yeah. So I started to kind of understand like okay so serotonin is like my insulin i need it and he was like yeah i was like what if i stop taking it i'll still be sick and he was like no what do you do with a running runny nose you blow it you take medication if you have the flu and you get better mm. and if you stop taking your i don't know ibuprofen if you have a headache you don't think like oh but my headaches are still here yeah no you take it you know it's gone afterwards and it's the same with antidepressants it's not like um, a mask you just take on for your depression. It's actual medication that helps you get better and will eventually at least take part in healing you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I started to understand that, that I, that depression, uh, antidepressants were just basically like insulin, like ibuprofen. I needed it and if I would take it, I started healing. And with this thought, it slowly came to me that depression wasn't really my personality mm. and with slowly i mean it took two years <laughs> yeah um it was it was a lot with the i couldn't sleep so the one antidepressant i took helped um helped me sleeping i was completely sleep deprived at one point mm. before i took the um the medication and then the other one i had to take in the morning so it helped me wake up or get up and um yeah it was, it, it was just a lot and i couldn't um, tell anyone and i <laughs> remember the first day i took my antidepressants was on my 18th birthday and the first thing you you get told when you can um, concede into taking medication taking antidepressant and antidepressants is don't drink alcohol Oh, don't no. Do drugs. oh no 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 so it was my 18th birth <laughs> no, birthday no 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 and um did you choose the date uh, to start taking them? At, at that point, I was so desperate to mm, getting okay. better, to not feeling like shit anymore. I just didn't care whatsoever about I the see. date. Mm. I started it. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's my 18th birthday. I don't feel anything. I'm not happy. I don't even want to be on this planet anymore. Yeah. Who the fuck cares if I drink or not? I didn't, I didn't feel good at that time, so I didn't want to celebrate my birthday. My parents more or less forced me to do it and I didn't want to disappoint mm. them. I didn't want to show them how bad everything has gotten with my mental health. So I celebrated and here I have to give a huge thank you to my best friend. 
because at that party um i had my friends over i celebrated with two other people so we were like 90 people or something whoa and i had birthday like we would celebrate into my birthday that night mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then at 12 o'clock there were like i don't know 20 people who ran to me and was like let's take a shot let's drink something mm -hmm. and everyone was so excited and i was sitting there like mm -hmm. so you haven't <laughs> drank before that point no i did i did drink also, oh, okay, i drank okay. before um but i stopped i had to completely stop alcohol mm -hmm. because it just wouldn't mix well with the antidepressants yeah. and while curing my depression and actually not being suicidal anymore weighted heavier than having a drink on my 18th birthday mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know just value wise so my best friend was there with me and I just told her like um, I had huge headaches and or I, I had the flu and had to, had to take um, antibiotics. So you mm -hmm. can't drink as well mm -hmm. when you're on antibiotics. So I told her that because she didn't know. I didn't mm -hmm. really tell anybody about um, the whole shebang that was going on. And I was like, you have to help me. Mm -hmm. And so every time people came to me and wanted to drink something, I quickly like ran to her grabbed her by the arm and um, pulled her with me and people would <laughs> would give out shots and everyone would shot and i just give it to her very like um <laughs> under the hand and she would <laughs> shot for me or, or um throw it to the side and then give it back to me and everyone thought i would i i drank with them i didn't i didn't consume any drop of alcohol it was very a very funny night um yeah that's she so was, so good that's she was huge. so drunk <laughs> <laughs> I believe so you. huge thank you and i'm so sorry <laughs> no but i think uh, that that could have gone really bad yeah yeah i just didn't want to like expose myself yeah yeah i um, get that because if you don't drink especially on your 18th birthday mm -hmm, mm -hmm. everyone will be, be like wrong. okay what the yeah. fuck is going on yeah 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 can i swear <laughs> yeah of course Wait. say um, fuck <laughs> uh um how many times you want nice Yeah, so I had her and I owe the world to her because I, yeah, like I said, I was just afraid mm. um, what would happen if people would see that I wasn't there with my car. So you can't really t go like, oh, I'm here with my car, I have to drive. Yeah. That was my, um, my Ausrede. Uh, excuse? Yeah, yeah that was my excuse. <laughs> so that was my, uh, I have to drive was the excuse for the next four years. So I hadn't um, had a drop of alcohol in f uh, in four years mm -hmm. um, since then. Now I actually started drinking again, like mm. just a glass of wine, which is so enjoyable. But yeah, not really important. Um, where was I? Yeah, and no one knew. I didn't drink. No one knew. My um, best friend was there for me. Um, I didn't really tell anybody what was going on. The only person that really knew was my mother, my father a bit, I think. I didn't, I never talked about uh, with him about this stuff to this day. Um, he's a lovely man and he is so sweet and so kind to me and I, I love him to the moon and back but I, we never talked about this um, it just never came up in that way I tend to do that a lot so at one point I'm, I was with my ther therapist and we talked and I was like I actually feel bad for not telling people because things are going on and I feel like some of those people who are in my life actually deserve to know what's mm. going on. Like I owe it to them, which in itself is bullshit, but I, I, I understand where I was coming from. Yeah. Back at that time. Um, so I told, I think, three people what was going on. Um, my best friend, the, the friend with um, the boyfriend who had, his, um, who had cancer, I told her. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt. What yeah. did your therapist told you when you opened up? Uh, he said that? you don't owe anyone anything. Oh, okay, so okay. he was like, if you want to do yeah. it, you don't owe them anything. He was a very, um, he was just a great person. I really, yeah. I connected with him on on a great level, which you're supposed to with your therapist. So I was very lucky to find him. Um, he just said it all plain, like you don't owe anyone anything, mm -hmm. but if you want to go ahead and do it, do it. Be prepared to get negative um, feedback. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
that's basically all that can happen to you. So I was prepared to get to receive ne negative feedback. I say that I wasn't. I was not re prepared, but I <laughs> tried to make myself to convince myself that I was prepared. So I um, went there and told them I did not receive negative feedback whatsoever. Um, all of my friends were like, "Okay, that explains a lot." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It 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 really did. At that point, I think I was like one year more or less into mm. therapy. I general information. I went to therapy for two years, and always the same therapist. Um, and I took my medication for four years, one of them. The other one I took until a year ago, I think. And then I just started to slowly um, get out, get off of it, which is very great. And I owe that a That's lot um, to my boyfriend, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he, he helped me a lot with that. So, yeah, I went to my, uh, to my friends and told them and they were... Supportive, I guess. Um, they they said it wasn't a problem, and um, because I always wanted to like rectify my actions and also mm. my future actions, so I told them that you know if I wouldn't be there in any social settings or would be a bit awkward or silent, it wasn't because I I don't know I didn't like them mm -hmm. or whatever. It was just I wasn't able to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I had depression. I also had social anxiety. I developed that. Um, at one point, I even um, developed paranoia, which was a very weird experience. Mm -hmm. um, I distinctly remember going home from school and I would wear my extremely baggy clothes. I'm not a huge person, so any clothes from like size L, I just vanish in them. <laughs> and I, I loved that. Um, mm -hmm. I got the, the baggy jacket from my cousin who's like two meters. So it was like XXXL <laughs> men's size. I just vanished in it. And um, I would always just like, yeah, I would hide in those clothes mm -hmm. so no one would see me and I wouldn't have to interact with anybody. And um, I remember going home from school and just people walked by and I felt and I even remember that, that people would look at me and stare at me. And I thought, everybody knows. Mm. Everybody knows how, how I feel. Everybody knows. Like, they know what I do. They know what I've done. Um, because I did one big thing that wasn't so great, which I'll come to um, in a minute. And it was just a very weird experience, like, I literally remember people staring at me, which I don't think they did. I think they just walked by with their dogs or whatever. But it, I remember them, their eyes on my skin mm -hmm. and it was horrible. So I tried to um, hide even more in my clothes and I more or less ran home, which I haven't done since I was like eight. So it was like wow. really weird. <laughs> um, so that was my, my paranoid face because I just thought that everybody knew what was mm -hmm. going on. And I was very embarrassed about that. I was in in general. I was pretty embarrassed about um, depression, or being depressed. Um, Can you explain to yourself why that was, or where where that shame or embarrassment came from? Um, I've always been embar em embarrassed of showing weakness. Mm -hmm. I um, I'm a dancer. I used to dance in two um, in two teams and will come be important in a second from one of those i would have to drive home alone because it was the only one from my like friends group who was there so i danced mm. with a lot of my friends and yeah it was just i was alone there basically and um it was a very um it was a kind of a good experience but also really really bad i was there alone and I, f I felt alone as well. I had my trainer who I knew for five years or so. At that point, he trained both of those groups and um, I was in this group and I felt so bad. I was like, okay, everyone is so much better than me. I don't deserve this place. I don't deserve to be here. And one of those, those things I was really ashamed of was like every time I um, would got back into my car to drive home like the first 10 or 20 minutes I would cry like every single week twice a week 
I would have this experience of just sitting in your car crying because you're so embarrassed of yourself, you, f you hate yourself, you feel like you don't deserve to be on this planet. Um, you feel like you take up too much space in a sense of another dancer who's much better than you could be here right now and actually mm. be, um, be a great component in this group and you don't deserve to be here anyways. And every time like my trainer would be like, Laura, you have to, I don't know, be, do this this combina combination differently or, or whatever, it would, it would stick with me for at least like a few days, which is mm -hmm. ridiculous. They were just simple and kind remarks to, to help me be a better dancer. And it felt like knives in my back. <laughs> it, it was really ridiculous. So I'd cry every time I'd go, go home. And I it was just a lot of night crying in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And... Um, because I would channel my my emotions into those speci specific situations where I was alone. I felt really alone and I could just let go of everything. Yeah. I think in therapy I cried maybe once or twice. And one of those was when I got the diagnosis of having um, an eating disorder, mm. which completely broke me. It was, which is stupid because I, I had an eating disorder already during this first year in therapy. Um, spoiler alert, by the way. So I was all, <laughs> uh, I was also anorexic by that in that time. Yeah, I was very embarrassed of those situations. Um, short excurs to the anorexia thing. Um, it went on for at least a year before that. Before I went into therapy, it was just like I wanted to lose a bit of weight. So I started doing a bit of sport. Um, I joined another dance team, whatever. So now from one, it was two. So I upped my sport. And then when I was in therapy, one of the first um, treatments, I guess, you suggested is um, doing sports and mm. cleaning and stuff. And I um, started running. I started distance running and it got so I got really bad with the running thing. I really obsessed um, about that. And it was like, um, <laughs> I I did sport. So I was like, okay, I'm doing something great. I'm having my depression and I'm losing weight. So that's great. Because mm -hmm. at that point, I wasn't really in that um, mm -hmm. anorexia mindset mm -hmm. yet. So I worsened my anorexia, but um, I helped my depression mm -hmm. with doing this uh, this kind of sport. And anorexia was... At one point, like approximately um, after my first year in therapy, it just became like a coping mechanism for my mm -hmm. depression because I didn't want to just face anything anymore. So facing numbers and trying to lose weight and just obsessing over something that is so unimportant, so ridiculous, just really helped me forget the like the this huge black dog following me, which mm -hmm. was my depression. So it became a coping mechanism. Yeah, so much for the anorexia. So it also went on during this first year, like during everything I just told you. Forgot about that. <laughs> How? Um, yeah. This whole driving back from the dance lesson thing kind of escalated at one point. It um, Because those became the times also where I could just let go and cry and feel all this, the, the lost self-worth, I guess. I just... I was numb all the time mm -hmm. and those were the moments where I could feel and that just helped me so much in a, in a kind of weird sense because depression isn't just being sad all the time. It's it's really not. It's feeling numb, which is way worse, which is where people try to, to self-harm and stuff. My self-harm was the anorexia. Um, so you feel numb and those moments where you can just sit on your bathroom floor and cry are actually, they help you mm -hmm. <laughs> in a weird sense and um for me it escalated because it um it happened so often like in a week at least two or three times where i could just let go and everything it built up and um therapy kind of helped i did everything i was really behind it i was trying to to like be the best person who ever received therapy <laughs> in this sense which is yeah, so ridiculous yeah. that um, fits to that um a level yeah. overachieving. Yeah, I, I try to really, um, to really, um, yeah, receive therapy mm -hmm. and not just like go there and sit there and just let time pass by. I try to really engage it in it. And I did. And it kind of helped like with the sports, my depression lightened. 
um, in those moments, in those very few moments, um, just a lot of endorphins. But then when I sat there in my car after after dance lessons um, and I cried, everything just broke down and it got really bad. It got um, so bad that at, I just started developing those those um, trains of thought where I was like, you don't deserve anything anymore. You take up space. Um, your parents could have another child that wasn't broken. And that really, um, really hurt me. Like just, just thinking, you're not the person your parents deserve. You're not mm. the person your friends deserve. You're not a person that deserves anything. You don't deserve your education. You don't deserve your home. You don't deserve food at one point. You don't deserve anything. You don't deserve therapy. You don't deserve happiness. And that's why you don't get it. It was really hard just taking all of this in. And when you're depressed, you're kind of forcing those thoughts on you, which is very ironic, but you are. That's that's kind of what depression does. It it digs you in a hole, in a very deep hole, and it's very hard to climb out of that. Um, you just get into the spiral, and it leads you down, 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 down all the way. And at some point, I was at my personal challenge at deep. I was at the deepest point where I could get, and I didn't see a way out. So I thought my only way out was um, just taking myself out of the equation. And um, so I started thinking about suicide. And at some point I started considering suicide. And I never told my therapist about that. He didn't know. Um, he didn't actually didn't know a lot. I, I really held um, a lot of stuff back, which is when the first time uh, in the first year of therapy, we only, I only received therapy for my depression and not my anorexia because he just plainly didn't know about it. Yeah. He also didn't know about my my uh, fantasies about committing suicide. And my fantasy would always be just crashing my car into a tree. That was like for me the only way I wanted to go. I wanted to go with like a crash. I wanted to go with a bang. I wanted to, the world to hear my pain, to see my pain. It sounds so stupid, but that's what I wanted. I wanted to go and I wanted to go fast and I wanted to go big. Um, so I started to be scared of driving because, um, I would also drive my friends, um, mm, with me, mm -hmm. with, um, to the, the dance sessions and I'd never do anything to, to, you know, to endanger them, yeah. obviously, but I was, I got scared mm -hmm. because every time I sat behind the wheel, I was like, is this the moment where I'll just pull it yeah. and do it? So I started become, to become scared and um, one night I just remember I, as soundlessly as humanly possible, went into our office space in our house, which is a separate room. And I sat down on my desk where I do my math homework and my English lessons and I wrote my suicide note. And um, I didn't know which tone I wanted to hit. Did I want to go with like an ironic tone? Did I want to be funny? Did I want to blame everything on everyone else but me? Did I want to go Sylvia Plath? I didn't, I didn't know. So there were a lot of versions. Um, the final one was plain. It was like bland salad, if you want to compare it to that. It just didn't have any note of feeling, which was exactly what I was feeling. Um, at the end of the night, I went into our uh, living room where there is a fireplace and it still burned because it was October, I think. It was kind of cold and I threw all the versions um, into the fireplace. And I would do that for another night. Uh, another night I would go into our office space and write more suicide notes because it just, I think it showed how undecisive I was mm. if I really wanted to do it or not. But one night, I just, without any suicide note written, I put on my shoes, I put on my jacket, I got the car keys from my mom because we shared a car, <laughs> and um, I just stepped out of our house and I looked at the car. And 
Very luckily, I went back inside. I don't know what drove me, but I didn't do it. I didn't close an eye that night. I, I just, I was awake all night and it was a constant, do I want to do it? Should I get up again? Should I do it? You came so far already, you just, you should do it because you deserve it. And everyone would be happier. I mean, in, in my brain, it was like, your family might be sad, but they won't be really devastated. They'll just get over it because they could have another happier child. Your friends, I mean, come on, they'll, maybe they'll cry one or two tears, but get over it as well. And you, you'll be happy because you're not there anymore. So um, everything seemed, it seemed like a really great idea at that time. Yeah. I didn't do it. Obviously, I'm here. Um, but that night really stuck with me. And every time I got behind the wheels, the wheel, I didn't know if this was the time where I'd do it. And um, I don't believe in God. I don't believe really in karma or fate. Maybe some things happened for a reason and this definitely did. Because at a point where I was, at this point where I was truly considering it and I didn't know if I would do it or not. Um, I got hurt pretty badly when I was training. Um, a bundle of my muscle fibers ripped and um, my leg was put into a, ca um, a cast, a cast, a cast, a case. Um, actually, I don't know. Jesus, a cast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. I know. And I got mean. crouches and I couldn't drive anymore. Hmm. I was not able to drive for three weeks. And so that was pretty recently after that night. After that night. Um, and I was just, just not able to drive anymore. And there was just no chance for me to get behind a wheel. So, like I said, I don't believe in any higher mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, maybe this truly happened for a reason. Because I don't know if I would still be here if I, wouldn't, if I wasn't hurt. If I wouldn't have been hurt. Yeah. So those three weeks, I basically just lay on my couch and went to therapy and went to school. Um and life started to normalize again because um, at that point I kind of mentioned this whole suicide thing <laughs> which was way more serious than I I told my therapist mm. so yeah I mentioned the whole suicide thing to my therapist and he he was like oh shit why didn't you tell me earlier and I, I looked at him questioning like are you serious? I wanted to kill myself. If I told you, you would just have me like put into a mental hospital. Mm. You can do that legally. Why would I do that if I, if I was if I wanted to con uh, commit suicide? And he looked at me very um, very deeply and was like, "Well, then you were truly co considering mm -hmm. suicide if you didn't even told um, tell me." And it was just like a light bulb bulb went up, and I was like, "Fucking hell! I need help." Mm. Jesus fucking Christ that was serious so we kind of intensified working and um, I was still going to therapy every week and I received it and slowly things got better we talked about like this whole depression spiral which is like this huge metaphor you have when you go to therapy I think everyone who ever received therapy for depression knows about this whole spiral thing which you have to break through through um, social interactions, through, you know, talking about your feelings, doing the things your body, your brain, your low level of serotonin tells you not to do. So we worked on that and my social anxiety really fucked with me at, um, <laughs> at that time. It was super, super hard, but um, I did it. And I could finally meet with friends again, even though I didn't really want to, but I could. I guess at the beginning it was like, when I was there, everyone was kind of silent because I was silent. I was just, I would sit there like a wet dog and be so unhappy mm. in, in any kind of social setting. So it was really hard to get back on this horse. Because where, where did you get the willpower for that? Because I have no it, idea. It, it sounds like you had that night, then yeah. the thing with your leg happened. Yeah. And after you opened up with your therapist and had that realization, like something seems to have changed in you like somewhere um you you got your strength for for those things because those those things are actually really hard to do 
um, especially yeah. with social anxiety. It is. And I wish I would have like a super inspiring answer for that. <laughs> but the truth is, I don't know. And I actually think that my, my anorexia really helped, helped me with that because I had another point of focus. Mm. So I'm I'm truly sorry for anyone who hoped to get like a recipe for like a 12 step program for how to <laughs> stop depression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sadly I can't um I can't I don't offer think that. there is one. Um no there isn't. I think just this realization of shit just was serious. Mm. Um and that I started to see that people actually cared about me and not just the people I pay to um care about me, like my therapist. But also like just my social surrounding, they um, they try to invite me more to things, and I actually went, which was probably a huge change just for me. Um, like I said, I started to focus more about losing weight, so that really helped. Trying to not focus so much on mm -hmm. on this whole depression thing. So yeah, this is really a really uninspired ending because it just leads into another social. Um, mental health issue it's but called life <laughs> yeah that's um basically what happened i just focused on my anorexia and it, i drove myself further into that but also it kind of more or less got me out of depression i was still depressed when i was mm. um like at my highest point in, anore um, in anorexia but um I started to be able to deal with it just because I had another point of focus. And honestly, depression takes time. Yes, it takes therapy. Yes, it takes medication. But first and foremost, it takes time. And it can get serious. I would say it got serious in my case. Um, luckily, I never really experienced any physical harm through that. But it just takes It takes a goddamn amount of time to get through it. You can't just expect to go to therapy and like in, in two months, it's like, all right, I'm I'm back, bitches. It just it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, um, but it doesn't. <laughs> so it was just a lot of time, a lot of um, a lot of anorexia. I I'm, I'm, don't know what to say about that. And trying to engage more with my friends and with my family. Um, I would lie if I'd say I, I've gotten good with that. I have like this one, this best friend I already mentioned who I talk to on a more serious matter. Like once or twice a year, just have a complete breakdown. I still try to channel my feelings into one situation, but it gotten way less. Mm. And um, I just break down and I can do that in front of her and it's fine. Um, But... Yeah, I don't really know where all this this internal force came from. It was just, I think it just built up over time. But I have a lot of that now, um, I'd say. I had a few, or well, one huge instance um, last year where actually after that I got my first panic attack. Mm. So this is a, uh, now very recent. It happened uh, in 2019. In the summer, um, my parents told me that they'd get a divorce. And a month after that, my mother got a diagnosis of uh, skin cancer. And I was I was devastated, but again, wouldn't really show, especially mm -hmm. with both of, the, both of those things, um, the divorce thing and the cancer thing. My parents literally told me not to tell anyone. Whoa. Um, Just because it was it was mm -hmm. um, very private and especially like with the cancer, my mother didn't want anyone to look at her differently, which I completely understand, which is why to this day, I barely told anyone about my anorexia. I think there are like three people running around this planet who actually know about that. Now it's definitely more, but um, yeah. So I couldn't tell anybody and I had to wait like two months or so until I broke down. I went home from uni. I sat in my car at this parking spot, which was completely empty. And I started to have a panic attack. I started crying and I didn't start crying because my mother had cancer. I started crying because I was so fucking scared of going back to that place, of going back into the place of depression. It was such tremendous fear 
that I couldn't even breathe. It felt like I was choking on the air. I was drowning on air. And it went on for like 20 minutes and I, w I wasn't able to do anything. I wanted to call my best friend because she just lived um, like five minutes from that, from this parking spot away. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't even grab my phone. I was just, I was like rocking back, back and forth like a baby and just trying to breathe because even that was hard. And um, I couldn't call an ambulance because I was actually thinking about that because I, I th literally thought I would die. Um, I didn't and I didn't call an ambulance. After 20 minutes, I just started calming down and catching my breath. Mm. And um, I drove home, home, Jesus, and I got out my, my, um, my therapy stuff, which I still had because you get a, I, I at least got a lot of worksheets mm -hmm. and just texts from um, books. And I took that out and um, because I, at that point, I already was out of therapy for two years, I think, one year. And at the end of my therapy session, we did like um, um, a treaty, more or less, like mm -hmm, if mm -hmm, this or mm -hmm. that happens, what do I do? Yeah. And um, I just got this whole thing out and went through all the worksheets, especially like at the beginning where depression really hit me hard and um, got back into this. Okay, try to identify just thinking mistakes. And it really helped. And I was so proud just to see like, okay, I can go. I Even if I go back to that place, it will never get this bad. Mm -hmm. It will never get this bad because I now have like the resources to... Um, to dig myself out of this deep, deep, deep hole I was in. And um, I would say it was a depressed, uh, depressed phase I went through in 2019, maybe for like four months or so, but it was, was never that bad. And I knew I had people around me. And then like, I think a month after the diagnosis, I told three of my closest friends because I just couldn't take that in. My parents were in the middle of a divorce, so home wasn't a safe place for me anymore, just like mentally and emotionally. And um, my friends even offered that I could live with them mm -hmm. for weeks or months or whatever. So I, I'm really happy to have, and I'm glad to have this amazing support system. Yeah. So that was um, a very recent, um, yeah stopped by and my depressive face and it was hard and it wasn't really nice and I was so scared of going back there but I didn't I worked myself through it and I'm actually really proud of that thank you so much for sharing I no problem honestly like in, in between I had a moment where I could feel the emotional overwhelm yeah. Uh, when you told about that night and that really dark time. Yeah. Because it just felt like so, I felt so much gratitude mm. that I could sit in front of you. Yeah, same. And. <sighs> I'm sorry if it's too no, much. No, 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 no. Uh, that's the moments um, I really treasure yeah. in conversations like this when you just take the moment to take it all in and if you ask me i i i felt like i could feel every word you you've told yeah and i think it's like for those people who who are listening it's 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 a great comfort to hear all that I and hope so too. Re really, like it's it takes so much courage to <laughs> to open up about stuff like that, and especially considering that it was hard to talk about some of that to your therapist <laughs> and also to to close people to friends. Um, yeah, it, it, well, to be fair, it wasn't hard. I just didn't want to because I didn't want to put in a mental institution. Yeah, I could have told yeah, right, him easily, right. but um, I just wasn't wasn't up for that. Mm -hmm. It would like cross my plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's 
especially talking about people, it's still hard. Like now I have like two people, my best friend and now I'm um, my boyfriend who I really talk to, I confide into um, and they pretty much know everything. And that's a great comfort to have those people. Yeah. And I hope that anyone who's listening and feels like they don't have this person, try to identify one in your close, close social environment. You almost always have a friend. Maybe you don't even consider them really a friend, but they might be actually worried about you. Um, try to find this person and talk to them. Maybe even they can help you to get help if you don't have the, the courage, which is absolutely normal <laughs> um, to do it. For me, it was my mother who mm -hmm. got me the therapist. Yeah, That's like a kind of small advice I could give you. Just try to identify people who care about you. How do you feel now, actually? Like, right now? Yeah. Um, heavy. I thought I'd feel light. Mm. I don't. Um, funnily, it's just um, especially like this those nights. I don't yeah. really talk about them. Never like depression um, and especially anorexia, which we're going to talk about in the next podcast or whatever. Um, I can talk about those things pretty freely, but um, the whole suicide thing was was pretty heavy and I it's one of those things where I don't tell people because I don't want them to to look at me any different yeah I got that yeah um so I do feel a bit heavy mm -hmm. and out in the open <laughs> so pretty vulnerable but yeah how do you feel <laughs> I I feel so fucking grateful like uh, really I I just, I have huge respect for you. Yeah. It's not something you've chosen to experience. It's not something you you wanted to experience. And it's not something you were prepared to experience or should have been prepared or whatever. It, it was just, it's, I think it's important to... to know where a person comes from and also just to really validate and appreciate the experience how horribly it was that doesn't matter it's the it's the good and the bad stuff that makes people who they are and i think in society we are more pressured to be that kind of bubbly and funny and <laughs> Um, it's just one side of us and yeah. the other side is completely normal too. Um, I don't know if you're open to share it, um, but I ask myself what did, what did I held back on that night? Um, actually I, I can't. What held me back to go into the car? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, I think I was always waiting for this moment for this like i don't know for this instinct to kill myself which obviously no human has i was waiting for it which is also why like even after this night i didn't kill myself even though i was driving um i was waiting for this moment where i was like yep gonna do it now mm -hmm, didn't mm -hmm. happen obviously um now i was i was just standing there and looking at this car and there was no internal motivation for me just to go into this car this one side of me was screaming to do it because then it would be finally over and i would have achieved something that's funny because suicide isn't an achievement felt like it though um but i didn't do it because there was just no no click i suppose i was which i was waiting for i can't really explain it i don't know i'm just happy that i didn't do it It sounds reasonable though and I've also um, heard one story where um, someone jumped from the San Francisco bridge yeah. and um, survived and he told that the second you do it you and the pain it. pushes you over that edge you actually regret it because I don't think that it's biologically wired in us yeah. that it would be good to do that it's just 
a comfort to know there's always a, a way out of a situation. And yeah, and also uh, another question that popped into my mind because you've you've told me before uh, that you you've done therapy for two years mm -hmm. and then stopped to do it. Do you want to to share that to people? Yeah. Um. After two years, I I dropped out of therapy, I suppose. Um. Like I said, after that um first year in therapy where we plainly focused on my depression, I um. I. <laughs> My therapist started to receive hints that maybe I had an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. um, he actually never really knew the whole extent <laughs> of it because it got really bad when I stopped therapy. The reason I stopped therapy had actually nothing to do with depression. So I guess that's why I didn't mention it. Um, it was plainly just because I didn't want to recover from um, anorexia. I was just not ready. And at one point it was just... You know, I had to, to do like a diary, an eating diary and like um, my thought processes when I, I don't know, ate an apple and felt horrible and like a disgusting fat human being, you know, that stuff. And it just became very repetitive and nothing changed. And I started to notice that, okay, maybe I don't just, I just don't want to recover yet. I want to see how bad it can get. <laughs> and so I did that and it got pretty bad. Um, But yeah, I was just not mentally not there yet to truly give myself into recovery. So that's why I stopped. It was just, I was wasting time, his and mine. So I stopped. Thank you for sharing that because I thought no it's, problem. it's might've been confusing for people. Yeah, to, it might. It's, to it's have hard. that transition yeah. um, to, to your panic attack, which was mm. more recently Yeah, and not knowing um, yeah, but that's that whole anorexia thing. Um, we thought it might be a good idea to save for another episode. Yeah. And um, <sighs> what a journey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I put you through this. No, but yeah, no, why, it was why, a journey. Why do you feel sorry? I, mean, I don't know. You feel you seem overwhelmed. I mean, I am myself, but I know what 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 happened. What would happen? Yeah. You just I threw you into the cold water. I'm sorry. Um, I actually don't feel that way. I just, um, I don't know. When I listen to stories, I kind of um, feel them. Yeah. You know, and it's for me an emotional journey I make. Um, and I'm abs I feel honored to to have made that with you, you know. Thank it's you. also a, a, a very intimate thing to know about someone. Yeah, definitely. It's... Um, Way below that small talk, how, uh, hey, how are you doing? Yeah. Where are you coming from level? And that I really appreciate because it's like very real and very tangible. It's not that mask we are all wearing usually. Um, so yeah, of course I am, I, I have this emotional aftermath, but I don't feel, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I don't feel heavy after that kind of story yeah. i just feel very honored very grateful to 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 have the um not ability to to have the pleasure. possibility to yeah. uh, i don't know if it's pleasure yeah, i mean <laughs> i mean i guess so it's just the saying but i know what yeah, you yeah, mean yeah, like yeah, just yeah. I'm, i'm just grateful that that you share that and i think uh like i've said before it's a it's a huge thing for people out there who are struggling um on their own maybe mm -hmm. have have no one to talk about it maybe you have no one to to listen um to and i think it's just giving people um perspective and usually i end these with the question Uh, which is very hard to answer, and you can answer it however you want, um, just what 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 you feel. Um, but for those who who could relate with you, um, who could feel what what you've told about, um, what would you want to to tell them? Mm. Especially for those who who have those thoughts, yeah. who have those strong beliefs that these thoughts are true about them um, and also 
it's it's them it's them it's their personality yeah i think there are a few things you i could give advice about well first of all just i know it sounds bullshit when a full-grown i don't know man or woman just sits there in a in a stool in front of you who's has like a doctor and is your therapist and this person just tells you like it's not you it's just your your disorder it sounds dumb because otherwise you wouldn't be there if you wouldn't believe that it's your personality um i went through it and trust me like i'm the way i'm sitting here now the way i'm talking now it has it's like light years away from how i was back then it was not my it was not my personality it didn't change um it did kind of change my actual personality and i personally think in like in a good way i'm able to reflect on a very deep level on situations and um things and acts but um it's it's really not your personality it's really not i can't stress that enough it's just you have a low level of serotonin this always kind of helped me just knowing what was actually going on mm -hmm. low level of serotonin your your brain isn't working right your kind of your brain has the flu more or less and it will it will pass with time with medication with therapy it's not you it's really it it really isn't it's yeah it's like diabetes it's just it's just another illness it's just hard because it's your brain and you think that okay now this is me your brain is just another organ it can you know it can fail in moments and depression for me was this moment where my brain just failed me and it acted in a way that i as a person normally wouldn't and made me act in a way that i normally wouldn't so it's truly not you it truly truly isn't um maybe also like i said try seek out a person who could help you who you could confide in and um, talk to them on a very well deep and personal level if you're not courageous enough to get help which is normal and completely understandable ask those people to get to get you the help you need go with it and work work on yourself and it will be really hard work and you won't you probably won't even really do it at the beginning or you won't feel able to but at one point you will see that you can actually do it and um yes it's hard yes it would be probably the hardest thing you've ever done um but it's definitely possible definitely and give yourself time give yourself a lot of time <laughs> because it won't be over in two months yeah i guess that's more or less the advice i can give it's not you it's your personal uh, it's not your personality it's it's an illness it just fucks with your brain so i don't know fight right back yeah thank you for sharing sharing that <laughs> um actually i had that thought um do you feel compassion for your younger self uh, i always feel uh, it's hard to answer the question if i could go back in time I don't think I would warn my younger self about the depression thing. Maybe I would tell her, like, <laughs> stay away from the car. <laughs> But um, I don't think I'd warn her about the depression thing. Yes, it was shitty. Yet, yes, it was more or less the hardest time of my life. Anorexia did take first place on that, to be honest. But um, it was especially, it was really, really hard. But I came out of it and I actually really like myself now so I'm really happy with myself and um, I would warn her about the anorexia thing so mm. that's definitely something I would tell her but the depression thing it's shitty but going through it it makes you not stronger it it changes you probably for, at least for me it did and in a good way so I would just tell her like there will be hard times but they they will be over and even though you have to work on it and it'll be the hardest thing you will have to do, you will get through it and you'll come out a better person and you'll achieve everything you want. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, do you mind um, telling people where they can find you? 
on the interwebs? Or... I actually do mind. I'd okay. like yeah. to stay anonymous. Um, however, I do have a lot um some books mm -hmm. um, that I, I read a lot. I also used to to um, to draw before my depression, but then when it hit, my concentration was just so low that I couldn't draw and I stopped drawing whatsoever for four years, which I truly regret, but I just couldn't. However, I started reading a lot. That somehow worked because I could take um, a lot of breaks without getting like out of the zone. And um, I almost exceptionally read um, young adult novels um, with the topic of mental health. And there are a few books and I I could send you like maybe a small list which mm -hmm. you could add on. Yeah. Don't really know them from my brain, like a few, but um, they truly helped. And it's not just listening to people on podcasts, but also reading about this. Because when I was depressed, podcasts weren't a thing. So <laughs> I, I just mm -hmm. read books. Um, but So I could see that even fictional people would go through this too. Yeah. So it truly helps. This is basically why I came here because I know it can help to listen to people who experienced the same or at least similar things. Mm -hmm. So I could give you like a list of books yeah, if that, anyone's that would be interested. Great, actually, yeah. yeah. But like social media, I, I, I kind of would mind. So yeah, yeah. it's Sorry. all right. Yeah. So um, if, if you want to to check all the other platforms out or text me or just, I don't know, sometimes you feel like um telling or sharing your gratitude you can do that at relatable podcasts on instagram or um, write me an email all the links are in the description of this podcast and i can also share that with laura um yeah and feel free to to follow this podcast if you find value in that kind of content thank you for listening um and going with us on this ride and yeah do you have anything else that that you want to to share mm -hmm. just i guess goodbye to the listeners and thank you for listening as well and being such such a kind listener and just asking questions when you saw that i was comfortable with so thank you a lot for that my pleasure <laughs> <laughs> yeah so people peeps have have a great day um and until until the next episode bye bye